Are you really feeling ugly or are you just judging yourself through the male gaze? That is the capacity of what it means to be made of clay. You are malleable. You are able to grow. If Allah truly did not think that you can make it through the chest of struggling with hijab, he would not put you through it. Wanting to be beautiful only becomes harmful when it starts impacting your relationship with Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello everyone. Welcome to Embracing Rahma. My name is Fatima and I am your host. Today's episode is really going to focus on the concept of beauty and hijab. And this is so incredibly important, I think, to address in the modern age where beauty is really a commodity, right? In the last episode of Embracing Rahma, we discussed decolonizing hijab and, you know, the systems of oppression that shaitan essentially, like, you know, influences like capitalism, colonization, and so on to really make us uncomfortable in practicing hijab as Muslim women to where we feel like we need, you know, especially when we live in the West, that we need to show up automatically on guard and feeling as if we need to prove that we are not oppressed unfortunately and i know that i'm speaking for so many of y'all when when i say this um because it is a, a reality for a lot of us we don't need to do that and if you want to know more about why i'm saying that give the last episode a listen inshallah you know even if you don't end up agreeing we can definitely like start some conversations around that topic as part two of the decolonizing hijab series Today's episode, it really just made sense to talk about the concept of beauty because it is a thing that so many of us think about. I remember asking y'all, you know, like, what are the, the things that y'all struggle with when it comes to hijab? And I got so many different variations of topics related to just feeling beautiful and feeling you are not ugly in hijab. And no one wants to feel ugly, right? Like, no one wants to feel like that at all. And inshallah, today, we're going to touch on societal standards when it comes to beauty. We're going to touch on beauty from an Islamic perspective, how it can be used as a tool to connect with your rub. What does it mean to feel ugly? And what can you do to, you know, counteract the thoughts that shaitan sometimes, like, really takes advantage of um, when it comes to, like, making us feel uncomfortable with who we are. With that being said, I wanted to read a quote to y'all by Sister Dalia Majahid. And this quote is really going to frame our entire conversation for today inshallah and the quote reads islam teaches that the condition of our world is a reflection of the condition of our hearts our external environment is a mirror to the internal one i want you to think about that and really legitimately like reflect on what beauty means to you exactly how much of what you consider to be beautiful is influenced by external factors whether it's influenced by the tv the media that you watch you know, social media, the conversations that you have with people, whether it's influenced by the people you see walking down the street and looking at how they dress and comparing yourself to them and so on. Also acknowledge the fact that so much of what we believe can live in our subconscious and really influence us without realizing it. I also want you to think about how much these external influences on our internal understanding and definition of what it means to be beautiful do you think affects you as a Muslim woman and how you feel with hijab, whether you feel ugly, beautiful, or whatever? Or even if you don't feel any of those things, even if you're just existing, I, I need to know your secrets. <laughs> but like, really think about it. And in the process of thinking about what beauty means to you, I want you to think about the times where you have felt ugly in the past, if ever, and think to yourself, like, do you think that that is just... A default setting that you've experienced for maybe not having a clear definition of what beauty means to you i know i might be projecting a little bit here and I, but i do know that for some people this might be relevant i promise you it is not a bad thing to recognize that if you are one of those people it's not a bad thing to recognize that because then once you recognize it you can start working on it and really decolonizing your mind to like a lot of the external influences that really try to prey on us right it's easy to want to run and get concealer to cover your bags if you've been told that bags are a bad thing it's easy to want to run and you know get anti-wrinkle cream if you've been told that only a youthful woman has any value in society it's really easy <laughs> to be influenced by these external definitions of what beauty is especially when they're sold to us and i know i talk about capitalism a lot but baby i promise you y'all like these influences are legitimately like preying on our insecurities as women or you know creating these insecurities for us and then preying on those insecurities it's no wonder why we can struggle with hijab and feeling beautiful in it so now that the stage is set for today let me go ahead and tell y'all the story about how i started practicing hijab in the first place i was in first grade and i was about six years old at a charter school in the u.s and 
and I remember there was a girl in my class and her name was Farhia and she wore jilbabs like and if you don't know what a jilbab is a jilbab is essentially a scarf that goes from the top of your head and sometimes it can go above your knees below your knees sometimes it can go all the way to the floor <laughs> And so I, I saw her wearing these every day and it was so unique to me because even though the school that I went to was full of like former refugees, immigrant kids, kids from all over the world, it, it really just so, it surprised me when I saw her wearing it because she would always be minding her business, number one, but number two, she always had the coolest things underneath it. Like, why would I turn around in class at times and she would be pulling it up and she would pull out snacks from it or her headphones? I was always so shocked when she did this. And one day I was like, you know what? I'm trying to do that too. So I ran home to my mom with the swiftness. I ran, ran, ran. And I went to my mom and I was like, Mama, I need you to make me some jilbabs. Like, I'm trying to start wearing jilbabs. And I want y'all to know, up until this point, like, I wasn't practicing hijab. I would go to school with my little pigtails or my little puff balls on my head. But yeah, like, up until this point, I did not practice hijab. And that was my first introduction to what, what it felt like to be a hijabi when my mom started making them for me. She never limited, like, hijab for me at all. She never told me to wear it, number one. But she also never limited it for me. So what I mean by that is like, we would go to the discount rack at Joann's or wherever. And we didn't have it like that growing up, y'all. We was on food stamps. But we would go to the sales section and she would let me choose whatever fabrics I wanted. As long as, you know, they were flowy and weren't like restricting me or whatever. She would let me choose. So I remember she would make me jilbabs that had like beautiful castles and were colorful, like silky gold and silky orange and she let me have at it <laughs> and so my initial introduction to hijab was feeling beautiful in it so not only was it a mischievous reason like my initial decision for wearing it was not rooted rooted in it being a tool for me to draw near to the creator of my soul it was more so rooted in mischief mischief right because i wanted to get away with stuff because my mom gave me that initial like freedom with hijab like I felt so beautiful in it. I felt so warm, so lovely. Like, I loved it. And I felt so confident in it too, alhamdulillah. Like, it truly, truly, truly gave me so much confidence. It wasn't until I got to college, y'all, <laughs> that the world opened up to me. And that's when I started being influenced by all the different things that you can be influenced by. And I really struggled with my hijab journey after that. I really, definitely struggled. And I really, like, questioned if I should have even worn it. You know what I mean? I'm sure that this is a story that a lot of y'all can probably relate to, especially when it comes to going to college in the West. And even if your struggle wasn't hijab, maybe your struggle was something else. Because baby, when I tell you the world opens up to you when you go to college, <laughs> and I'm not saying that's necessarily a good or bad thing, right? It could be both. SubhanAllah, like, I really just went down a rabbit hole where I had to ask myself all the difficult questions, all the difficult questions for things that I didn't want to address, for things that my ego was like, baby, you don't need to talk about this right now. You go worry about this later. <laughs> and now we are here. When I think back now to all the times that I struggled with hijab, those are all the times where I didn't know what beauty meant to me. And so I was subconsciously trying to fulfill societal's expectations of what beauty meant whether I wanted to admit it at the time or not, as opposed to trying to manifest the Islamic perspective of beauty, right? We know Islam is the deen of the middle path. We know that Islam is like the deen where you're encouraged to strive for balance and everything that you can, right? Um, so then I'm not having this conversation with y'all to push the idea that wanting to be beautiful is a bad thing. There's even a hadith where our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, says that Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty, right? And that's subhanallah it's so interesting hearing that because allah's attribute his one of his 99 names is al jamil right which means the beautiful one i think it was the last episode where i mentioned uh mikhail ahmed smith essentially said that allah teaches us his name so that we can get to know him number one but also number two because we have a sense of ownership over his name we all own a small portion of allah's names and what that means is we have the responsibility to try to manifest those characteristics or the opposite of those characteristics in our life right and and so when it comes to beauty, especially when it comes to material beauty, because we'll talk about immaterial beauty after. If you are able to clothe yourself in clothing that is not messy, clothing that is not dirty, you know, it looks like taking care of your hygiene, your oral, your oral hygiene. That is beauty. Make sure your breath don't stink. You know, taking care of your hair, clipping your nails. These are all acts of worship, but all a means to draw near into Allah and to really fortify our definition of what beauty is, right? It goes without saying, though, that 
over and over again in the Quran and in the Hadith, we hear all the time the importance of, you know, purifying our inner selves and being beautiful internally in terms of how we think, how we walk, how we talk, how we carry ourselves. And these are all foundational elements that we can use to even, to fortify our definition of beauty even more. Because I truly, truly, truly believe the stronger your definition of beauty is, that you have within yourself, the harder it's going to be to control you and to convince you otherwise. The harder it's going to be for shaitan to come in and try to convince you that you are ugly. Because at the end of the day, like society, for example, is always going to have its own definitions of what beauty is, right? In the West, 20 years ago, beauty looked like being extremely thin and having blonde hair and blue eyes. Obviously, the definitions are changing now, alhamdulillah. I do acknowledge and understand that if you don't fall into that mold, that in itself can be a test from Allah for you. There's even a story about a sahaba named Julaybib, anhu, who was essentially looked at as being very ugly, very disfigured, very unattractive during the time of our beloved Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah, like when I heard his story some years ago, I was really touched because Allah really teaches us through Islam and, you know, preserving stories like that of Julay Beeps for us so that we know that even if you don't match and you don't fall into society's definition of what it means to be beautiful, that is a test for you, especially in this dunya, right? Like everybody has their test. It's like the opposite of this test for you, right? Yusuf alayhi salam with his intense beauty. They even say that he had half the beauty of the entire world. That's how beautiful he was. And I think oftentimes we forget that Allah knows for us humans, these things are not going to be easy. That is why they are called tests for us. That is why they are means for us to draw nearer to him because he knows that we are going to be struggling with these different things. Whether it's, you know, putting too much uh, emphasis on what it means to look good and on appearance and stuff or the complete opposite. Like Allah recognizes these things. As Muslims, we understand and we acknowledge the fact that Sometimes it's going to be struggles in this lifetime. We can't let that break us, right? Because then what would we be left with? If Allah truly did not think that you can make it through the test of struggling with hijab, he would not put you through it. And I think that's a huge testament to how much value Allah puts in us as humans. Because he knows that we can always do and be better. Alhamdulillah, like that is the capacity of what it means to be made of clay. You are malleable. You are able to grow. But at the same time, it also means that you could be manipulated. And so I think that's why it's even more important that we hold ourselves accountable to the thought processes and the things that we allow to, you know, really live in our minds. I also want us to consider the male gaze as well. And what I mean by the male gaze is looking at yourself through the perspective of what a man deems attractive. I think oftentimes as women, we're encouraged to look at our value based on what a man sees as attractive. So the next time you feel ugly, I want you to ask yourself like, are you really feeling ugly or are you just judging yourself through the male gaze? Yeah, that's a big one. I say all this to encourage you to look at yourself through the lens of Islam, especially when you're struggling with hijab. I also want to touch on the spiritual aspects of hijab and how important it is as Muslims to acknowledge the fact that hijab is simply a tool for us. Hijab is a tool to draw nearer to the creator of our souls. That is what it is. <laughs> And so in your practice of being a hijabi, in your practice of wanting to be beautiful, I want you to acknowledge the fact that wanting to be beautiful only becomes harmful when it starts impacting your relationship with Allah. I'm going to repeat that again for the people in the back. Wanting to be beautiful only is an issue when it comes in the way of your relationship with Allah. Because nothing is inherently haram, right? Like even a pig itself, the existence of a pig itself is not haram. It's only when you have the option to eat other things that you reach for a pig that it becomes haram. Same thing with alcohol, right? You use rubbing alcohol to clean your wounds, but can you drink it? No, you can't drink it. <laughs> are you able to enjoy beauty in a way that can be haram? Of course you can. But these are things that I really want you to think about because oftentimes we are told to look at the things that happen in this dunya from the perspective of extremes, right? You can't be beautiful. I don't know. It must be like a symptom of shaitan, right? Like when Allah made Adam and shaitan literally just like took it so personally and jumped to the complete extreme and said, you know, I'm better than him. It's a form of arrogance to jump to the extreme of things and to not acknowledge the nuances, the little minute subtle differences of things that could exist between the extremes. For shaitan to like take such offense to it when Allah created Adam, you know, is very indicative of his wanting to just jump to the extremes. And so these are things that we also have to consider when it comes to how shaitan might influence us. Now, shaitan can't make you do anything, right? At the end of the day, we know that he can't make you do anything. There's even a Quran verse that talks about this and how on Yom Al Qiyamah he's going to come to us and be like, yeah, you know, I, I, I ain't make you do that. You're the one who did it, you know? <laughs> he's not a writer. He's not going to be a writer, die, y'all. 
So I want us to acknowledge that at times, shaitan can come and whisper was was to us about the most extreme things, right? The most extreme things as if multiple things can't be true at the same time. You can feel beautiful and wear hijab at the same time. <laughs> and I think a lot of it is rooted in being intentional, right? Because I think the more intentional that you are, the more pleasure you derive out of the things that you do. Wallahi, that is so incredibly true. The more intentional you are, the more pleasure you derive out of the things that you do. Because you know that every action that you do, it has a purpose behind it. Because subhanAllah, you know, I feel so beautiful in my hijab when I think about the fact that I am practicing it in the way that I'm practicing it because I believe that it is a means for me to draw near to Allah. One of the reasons why I started wearing naqab is because I felt like I was being so inauthentic and I would leave the house or I would start recording videos and I would put makeup on. And that's not even me. Like, I don't even, I don't even like makeup normally. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, like Allah guided me to the decision of making the choice to start wearing naqab so that I could be authentically like worshiping him in these little ways that I normally would have never thought to do. For me, it was so easy to run and put on concealer under my eyes because of my bags. I wanted to hide my bags. I didn't want nobody to think that I looked tired or this or that or this or that. But at the end of the day, I was doing these things so people wouldn't think certain things about me so that they could be more comfortable not for me it was for them alhamdulillah like because i started wearing naqab now i'm more aware of my intentions when i put on my clothes alhamdulillah and i pray that we're all given strength to walk through our hijab journeys with confidence because i know that it is not always easy like oh lord knows it is not always easy <laughs> We're going to move into the next segment of today's episode where I really wanted to focus on looking at hijab as a tool of empowerment. OK, all of these different definitions, these different rules or whatever that we try to live our lives by, they're all going to pass. What's trending today might not be trending tomorrow. The one thing that's going to be eternal is Allah. And so I think when we try our best to try to like live by making him happy, it really just makes us happy at the end of the day too. Cause it's like, he knows us better than we know ourselves and he knows what's better for us than we know. Let's go ahead and move into practical steps for being confident in hijab. One of the things that I always tell everybody is try to find your style as a hijabi. Maybe to you that looks like wearing salwar qamis or wearing jilbabs or abayas or maybe that looks like wearing whatever cultural wear unique to your society and where you've grown up at. Another thing I want to touch on is having a positive body image and how taking care of yourself physically can be a means for you to feel beautiful. There's a reason why people who work out are so confident, y'all. The endorphins, the, you know, the chemicals, the hormones that are released from your body when you're working out, when you go for walks, when you, you know, do strength training, when you stretch, when you do mo mobility exercises, when you run, taking care to be really intentional in the, the things that you do to take care of your body are all means for you to truly feel beautiful about yourself. Because then you're like, hold up, like, me, I'm investing in myself to be the best Muslim that I can be. These are all ways for you to truly, truly, truly feel and be beautiful. Another thing is community support. Oftentimes, some of us are our best selves when we are around other people who are good. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. There's a reason why Islamically, like, we're even told, you know, that you're on the dean of your friends because you are who you surround yourself with. And community is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing because we can encourage one another to do good and to prevent ourselves from doing bad, right? Alhamdulillah. I know community is not something that is accessible for everyone. And so for those who might not have this, know that communities online are definitely a good alternative to not having the in-person community. And may Allah put you in a position where you can experience the beauty of having an in-person community. I mean, the last thing that I wanted to talk about when it comes to, you know, practical tips for feeling confident in hijab is honestly probably one of the most important. And I know I touched on intentions a bit earlier, but I really want to focus on that now and remind y'all that a part of beauty is really living intentionally. And I, one would argue that it's one of the heaviest parts of feeling beautiful in anything, right? Because when you see someone who's beautiful, what do you think to yourself? Oh, wow. Like, look at them. They take care of themselves. Like, wow. Like, they must have been really intentional. You see where I'm going with this? When you live and try to practice being intentional, I promise you there's so much love and respect that you grow within yourself because of it as a result. That is it's kind of hard to convince you otherwise that you are not beautiful. <laughs> with that being said, I want to conclude this episode, you know, with reminding you of really determining what your definition of beauty is and living by that, inshallah, especially as Muslim women. Because then even when you're struggling, you can fall back on your definition and be like, hold up, this is what beauty is to me. Let me back up a little bit. 
I want us to more normalize having these moments of reflection. And even our beloved Prophet وسلم, was known to go to the cave and just think for hours, days, and just really think to himself about the various issues that plagued society. With that being said, this concludes the second episode of the Embracing Rahma podcast and the Decolonizing Hijab series. The next episode is going to be about navigating the opinions of others, inshallah, and accessibility as it relates to hijab and some of the different things that we can do within ourselves and our communities to really make practicing hijab that much more easier for ourselves and the next sister. May Allah allow us to be of those who make it to Jannah and look for one another. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.